let's talk about what kind of subject matter is important to you. I found that when I first started painting, then I, I, what was important to me was, was kind of painting as a, a perceptual event. So the subject matter I chose kind of reflected those conditions around perception. The convenient subject matter in that case? Yeah, I, I, I painted still lives. You know, I put myself out in the landscape, but I found that rather than painting trees, you know, I painted how I looked at the trees. And this is your when you were studying in New York? Uh, it was when I was drawing before I even went to New York to study. You know, I found that it w you don't know this as you're doing it. it. It's really interesting how painting is a process that it sort of unfolds and, and kind of becomes revelatory the more you paint. Mm -hmm. Um, but if, when I look back at the kinds of things that I was trying to do in my drawings early on, then I wasn't only, say, drawing a face, you know, somebody's face, I found myself drawing how I was looking at the face. And, and some of the technical issues around that process became overwhelming for me, in that if I were trying to draw a face, say, then if I found myself being slightly above and to the left of the face, for example, then I really struggled trying to create the planes of the top of the nose or the top of the chin or looking underneath the nose, you know, at the top of the lips in a particular way. So, um, so you became aware of technical challenges? Or I became aware over time of technical challenges that led me to understand why those were important challenges for me. You know, it was a subject matter of how I look. You know, so uh, the how I look isn't just a, a question of technique, but it, it, it leads to the next question of why is that important to me? So like how I look. So there's two ways of looking at subject matter. Normally we think of subject matter as what it is that you're trying to paint, the subject of your painting. You're pointing out that the subject matter also included you as the artist in the process of doing That's painting. exactly right, yeah. And it goes beyond this question of, of you know, a, a question that kind of, um, came to me at a later date was this question of authorship. You know, I found that when I read Hemingway, for example, you know, uh, who Hemingway saw himself to be in the world was very much what he wrote about, you know, not just what he's seeing and, 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 and say the condition of that old man in the boat dealing with the circumstances that he's in, it's rather Hemingway pondering that old man in the boat in the condition that he's in. And, and I guess you could even push it to the point that it's sort of a fanciful autobiography. But it's still Hemingway's um, uh, zeitgeist mindset, so who he sense, was. Each painting is also a story about you. That's it. As the it, artist involved and engaged. Yeah, that's it. So I found myself designing compositions, for example, that let me see the painting as a picture box, sort of like a shoe box with a hole cut in the end. Uh, and where I put in? Peeking in through the hole, exactly. And, and the way I peeked into the hole led the viewer, or led me to understand where I position myself in the world as I view it. And, and in a sense, that's a physical metaphor for how I position myself in the world otherwise, psychologically, spiritually, emotionally. Um, so so I've, art doing art is in a sense an extension of your life. Uh, I don't know that I, no, I wouldn't say, well, yeah, I guess in the broad way, but I'd say it's, it's an extension of uh, how I position myself in the life and what I see from that, that place. And, ha and how did your choice of subject matter evolve over time during the course of the last, let's say, 20 years? Well, it seems to have led to some place where, I guess, a, a pivotal event or a series of pivotal events in, in, in the life of my family. Uh, has affected me, and, and obviously that's the Holocaust. Uh, so the, the, these Holocaust events that my parents were involved in, um, and that I as a child growing up heard all about, um, affected me deeply. And, but they affect me in that I can't live their lives, and I don't paint that, and, but rather I see all of those events as being quite contemporary today. Explain and, that. Well, I painted a series of images of, of children, say children that had survived the Holocaust by being hidden. They're, I called them the lost children. Uh, and these, these, the, I found images uh, in various archives 
uh, and uh, these are images of, of children that were posed with their nameplates in front of them by an organization that had, had uh, discovered them after the war and tried to uh, repatriate them to families. And, and so these images were presumably distributed uh, so that if hopefully somebody would recognize these children and, and you know, return them to their families. Now, for me, these images of these young girls in, in, in the series that I did, holding their nameplates in front of them, were images of, of people that had suffered identity uh, loss, let's say. That uh, these, these children, particularly, were penalized for being women, young girls, were penalized for being Jewish, uh, and, and um, they, they were to suffer, you know, losses associated with those penalties. Uh, and, and they had to assume other identities as a result of them being young girls that were Jewish. They had to be uh, identified as non-Jews and they had to be put into other, or hidden, you know, their, their, their true identities were hidden. And how it, do you build a bridge to today with that kind of... I think that the same thing happens thing. now. The, I, I think that uh, who we are, uh, at least the discovery of who we are, um, is difficult. There are obstacles everywhere. There, there are obstacles within us. There are particularly obstacles outside of us. We're asked to, to be those kinds of things that we're not. Um, we're asked to, if, 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 I mean, the simplest metaphor is that if, if you're a sprinter, you may be asked to run a long distance race. Um, and, and you won't succeed in that necessarily if you don't have the equipment to do that. Um, I mean, that, that's, uh, I guess, a pretty bold metaphor, but... Uh, well, you had a second series of paintings of, in a certain sense, heroic women of the Holocaust period. Yeah, they, what, what again, that, that was quite contemporary too, because uh, I think people saw them as a celebration of, of these women uh, that survivors who, who survived and, and uh, um, tried to, uh, I guess, remediate the uh, uh, the destruction that you know their families uh, uh, suffered by the, um, their their Nazi oppressors. But when I read their stories. Most of them suffered deeply at the hands of the, the uh, partisan bands that they, they tried to join. You know, uh, often uh, they were um, abused uh, by the men in the bands that, uh, the partisan bands that they were joining. And, and so they, uh, again, they were outsiders. Maybe, you know what, it's occurring to me at some level, you know, I sort of side with the outsider. And, and we're not, I'm not just talking about somebody that, uh, uh, is marginal because of their own inabilities. I'm talking about people that are marginalized uh, by events that are beyond their control. Uh, and uh, there's a whole soft underworld, I guess, all around us, continuously populated by people that uh, are of great value uh, to the planet, but are not going to contribute to that planet. And I seem to seek them out. I think that uh, in taking a look at these images, for example, when we all of us went to the the Women's National. What was that meeting? Oh, the yeah, there was the, that Canadian. Uh, there was an association of Canadian and you had Jewish Women Federation there on the wall. Yeah, and you had two Holocaust survivors from the Lodge Ghetto speaking. And I turned to Michael Gary and I said, Michael, in ten years they may not be here. These people are in their nineties. So this is a kind of witnessing. And then they were very receptive to the images. And what you thought was heroic, well, they sort of countered the image because they brought everybody to life. They knew some of these people. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree. I'll tell you though that there's something else that it only occurred to me after the fact. The the woman that uh, spoke, that Holocaust survivor, that was a partisan band member, Sarah. Sarah, her name's Sarah Genite. Yeah, you did Rubinson. a painting of her only to discover that she in fact lived in Toronto. That's right. There was an interesting confluence uh, of events there, that, and I, maybe I should tell you that too because it it, it it has an interesting ending that I want to tell you about. So um, while doing that Holocaust series of, of, of um, heroic women, uh, partisan me uh, band members, um, I discovered, sorry, let me, let me describe it a little bit better. Um, I didn't know who one of the women was because I couldn't find much information on the net about this woman. And I saw this image. How did images in the first place? I discovered, a, 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 I guess, a repository of images in one of, the, yeah, one of the websites I visited. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I used them, and, and, but there wasn't a lot of information about who these women were and, and what they had done and where they came from, what happened to them. 
So in the course of trying to discover some information about one of these women, uh, I ran across uh, the director of the Holocaust Center here in Toronto who knew this woman. So we talked about her, but then he also told me that there was this other woman who uh, lived in Toronto who was a friend of the woman that I was questioning uh, and that uh, maybe I want to paint her and he offered to send me the image of her. So when I got that image, I was stunned because it was actually an image that I had already started on my, uh, on my easel. So I had laid the image out and uh, I had started the painting. So I thought that this is a coincidence that has some significance to it. So the rest of the story, I mean, in, in, in it, it, I guess in hindsight, the, there was substantial coincidence. So here's the rest of the story. I met the woman and uh, we had a number of really interesting conversations about how she saw herself. Uh, in context of what she was doing at the time. And she continuously reminded me, and this stood out, uh, that she was not a hero, that she did what she had to do uh, according to her ability to do it at the time. So she saw herself as being an ordinary in many respects, gifted in some, but not in, in terms of the things that she was doing uh, that positioned herself as, as a Holocaust resistance fighter. So she saw herself as literate and articulate and empathetic, but she didn't see herself as particularly brave uh, and, and, and uh, a, a courageous fighter. You know, she just did those things that she had to do, she felt, and that were opportunistic for her. But she did incredible things in spite of, of you know, her, um, I guess, modesty. Um, and in any case, um, the series of events unfolded so that ultimately uh, I wound up making the painting and having it hung in the, the, this, the, the, this women's center so that, and, and this is the significance for me, anybody coming in now will see it. So why is that significant? Well, here's the rest of the story. One of the things that stands out for me was the story of Yehuda Hamakabi. And it stands out for me because it was a story that my mother told me about this miracle event that had taken place around the liberation of, of the, the, the temple, you know, from the Roman occupiers. It's a biblical story. But it was a biblical story, right? And I like the idea of miracle. And I like the idea of, of people extending themselves beyond the circumstance that they're in, doing things that, uh, that are extraordinary, even though they see themselves as ordinary people. You know, I, I, there's, there's something... Um, profound, you know, in that kind of an event. So that story has that meaning to me. Um, and, and, and Yehuda Hamakabi, in a sense, is, is kind of a, a mythic hero, you know, for me. And, and, and I may play games in my mind, sort of alternating his identity with mine, you know. So, but it, it's still, there's a kind of an ideal about possibilities, you know, the human experience. Yeah, you in that. fused this into a series of paintings with these heroic women. Yeah, well, I didn't. See, I, I just painted her in, in an early sense without knowing that actually I was creating a mythical hero. I was taking this, this ordinary woman who did what she had to do under the circumstances that was, she was in, made this, this, this really striking uh, image into a painting uh, and hung it at the Women's Center so that now other young girls coming in will have her as a new hero. No, so, so, so in a sense, I'm passing on that kind of, a, of positioning in the world that Yehuda HaMakabi had meant to me to some other young girl who may come in and turn to her mother and ask, who is that woman in that painting? And maybe the story of, of Sarah Gennady uh, Rubinson will be told to that young girl, and then this young girl now will have a hero to direct the actions in her own life. So let me reach back for a second. So we, you, you talked about a socially meaningful art, and you talked about young children who yep. were in an earlier series, who are children who were lost and found, so to speak, or hidden and found again and given a, a chance to have a life. And then you spoke about these heroic women who, in a certain sense, themselves were marginalized characters, e even among the people with whom they were fighting as resistance. And then you, you had these idealizations of them, or ideas about them, in the same sense you had ideas about biblical characters. But when you come to meet the person, 
the texture becomes much more profound. Your gesture in the end of having the painting hung for the purpose of uh, raising consciousness or giving a sense of confidence is still there, but the person becomes more textured individual, becomes more real for you. That's right. And then this infuses your, itself in your art. Yeah. So maybe See, this is a good time to go over and take a look at some of the work that you're working on to talk about how you take the character who is important to you and socially meaningful and begin to invest that person in the canvas so it takes on life. So Harry, we were, we were talking about the different stages of your work in this uh, theme area and you had the uh, discussion about the children's images. What, yep. And here we have a, a, at least three examples of them. What can you tell us in terms of how you depicted it or stylistic challenges that you face or what in particular interested you about these images? Well, when I first saw these images, the, uh, I was struck by somebody asserting their identity. You know, it, it's... Uh, and these are all black and white originally. Yeah, huh? they're all black and white. And they were really... Uh, uh, imagine the, the the technology around that was available to take these images in the first place w was not uh, strong and so these images have degraded over time so trying to decode them was a real challenge and I like that challenge because it, it kind of is metaphoric of the idea of how, how you decode people's identity to begin with. And disappeared you know, you, people who are reappearing. Yeah exactly so trying to, to un, you know use these old images to understand who these people were was kind of in keeping with what these people were trying to do. Now in these, so, in these three images we see kinds of smiles or happiness or was that in the image or is that something you infused in no, the No, no, I, I tried to make the image as accurate as I could from uh, what was given to me in, in the, the photograph that I was working on. So how do you see these expressions because they're all quite, you see them, here I am, I survived or how do you, how do you see No, I, I see them, well the, each one is quite individual. Uh, individualistic. If you look at the rest of the series, you begin to see that they all have their own particular characterizations. Of the face. Yeah. And, 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 and the gesture. And I mean, the gesture. gesture, even though it's the same, there you know, are little nuances of, of kind of asserting individual feelings. Hand about positions. The hand example. position, the cock of the head, the, you know, the, 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 the set of the, soul, the shoulders. All of these things are things that I look for anyway, because I think it's body language tells you who you are. And, you and know, how many of these did you do? Uh, I started a series, so I, I've done six of these so far, and uh, I have many more that I'm still going to paint. And not all of them have the same, you know, form format. Not all of them are holding up signs, but these are children that were photographed and, and brought to the world. And do you know lost. if they were repatriated? Do you know what? I know nothing happened? about them other than their names, and their names are a part of the image. And you know, the, all so. the color decisions you made were idiosyncratic to you. Uh, part yeah, of an yeah, decision. yeah. They, all of these were uh, uh, beamed, uh, de deteriorated images, and so I had to add the color. And what and kind of decisions did you make stylistically? What color and, and brush stroke, etc., or forming the face, the figure? I have a bias about form, and and I have about, uh, uh, I guess a painting bias about light and form and space. Mm -hmm. So I, I tried to choose color that was much more subdued than my normal uh, color. Mm -hmm choices but still would give me a sense of form and space and the space is lit mm -hmm. and the the space is lit not as is uh, uh, a, a kind of a light source but is lit from within and uh, it feels to me that they sort of emerge yeah exactly that. and in and, and that that sense of emergence you know sort of fits in with the theme mm -hmm. of what these things are all about anyway so I don't know how successful that is, but that certainly was very much on my mind. Did you pay them quickly, or like what kind of time are we talking about investment in, in each of your images? Well, that, that's, a, that's actually a good question. Some of these images uh, uh, emerged in one or two sessions. This painting here emerged in a single session. And I found myself holding back in a second session and then just letting the image live for what it is. So if you look at the painting, then there, there's, it, there are opportunities to get back into it. But uh, those opportunities... Unresolved issues. Unresolved painting issues, yeah, unresolved painting. but in terms of where the painting is right now, it says something to me that I would lose if I tried to continue with it. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, feel, say this painting that? here, yeah. took me about five sessions, six sessions to bring it to where it is. And I don't know that I advantage the painting by taking through its fifth or sixth session. It, I, I think that I begin to change paintings at some point 
so that they become something else. They, they don't work, perhaps, in some cases. Um, yeah, overworked was, is a way to describe it, but then they stop saying what they, they had the chance to say in the Lose first iteration. The freshness or the spontaneity? Well, you know what? No, hang on. I'm trying to do something else. I'm trying to tell you that there, there's a point in a painting where you don't hit a technical wall, but rather you're taking it into a whole other discourse. And mm -hmm. if it, it, it's a valuable discourse, but if it's not, if your intention isn't to go there, you know, if, if, you, if you're taking... You discover a new path down the road, you can choose... Yeah, you know, like if, if you find yourself in that place because you're, you're pursuing, you know, say, following a technical thread, uh, the discourse, though, suffers because if you continue to follow the technical thread and you're letting the discourse sort of fall by the side. And, and I'm just learning that if I take a painting into a technical, you know, domain where I'm trying to solve its problem, but I don't have a discourse any longer, then I lose the, the painting. the discourse, you mean some of the narrative substance of the work? Oh, uh, well, what it is that I, uh, what it is that I'm trying to accomplish in the painting, yeah. Now, I just out of curiosity, when you finish this kind of work, do you feel a kind of empathic attachment to the, to the figure, or do you still see yourself as detached from it as an artist? Uh, creating a work. All of it. it it's really, it, it's conflictual and there isn't any one answer to that. I feel an empathic connection to the, you know, the, the image as well as the people in the image. In a uh, sense, feeling a love for the child? Uh, An attachment I, to the child as a person? I, it's more complex than, uh, than a love. You know, it, it, it's the child, I, I try and make them um, exist within the context of a painting as a painting exists. You know, I, I try to create a sensual event. Uh, so uh, if the central event begins to evoke feelings, mm -hmm. then they can be all over the place. It's and not you. just yeah feelings or in the, the viewer or in the viewer. viewer. Yeah, but it, it may not just be a feeling of love. You know, it may feel, it may be a feeling of, of a kind of empathy around uh, there say a pain in the hand or, or you know those kinds of things. So, so in the act of doing the hand, you begin to get a sense for the character and the situation that they're in historically. Well. Um, in other words, in the gesture? It, it's, it's complicated, but for me, I'd say that if somebody can understand that the hand is real, you know, real as, as a painted hand, then it leads to the idea that the event is real, the person is real in a, in a real event. You know, there, there's the ability to project yourself into the painting and then hypothesize a reality. So it's not the reality of the person, but rather it's the reality, the hypothesis of the viewer. You know, so you create a connect. relation between yourself and the character in, in the image, or the viewer can do the same thing. But I think one of the things you spoke about early is that earlier is that they're historically grounded people. That's correct. These are yeah. children who That's are lost right. and found. Yeah. It's the act of being found, so to speak. Yeah, but then I'm giving the viewer a chance to participate in that historical event yeah. as a melding of their their now with the, the, the subjects then. Yeah, they bring yeah. their understanding of life today, and they understand this historical event in relationship to their own life experience. That's right, yeah, but, but see, that makes it contemporary now. So the event then begins to exist in the present at the same time the as the present. Just like the character from the Bible story. That's it, exactly. Well, exactly. Let me turn to the adult figures that you've done. As you've done the, ch the children's figures and then the adult women uh, were in a, a next series. So, yeah. you know, you want to tell us a little bit about that and maybe about the project you are going now. Well, this is an image that uh, was a, um, one of the pieces that I did. It actually was contemporary to my doing these children's uh, series as well, but these were Holocaust uh, resistance fighters, women Holocaust resistance fighters. And this particular young lady was uh, an incredible, powerful woman who actually survived the Holocaust and eventually moved to Israel and became part of uh, um, I guess a lot of social change in Israel as well, but uh, she was one of the people that organized the uh, the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, and and actually survived that. And uh, it, it must have been a horrific um, series of, of events in her life at the time. What one of the things but, that stands out for me in viewing it, you get a real feel for your texture, your buildup of paint. Tell me about the effect of this texture on the experience, because you almost it becomes palpable. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly uh, what I tried to do. Uh, again, it's the same thing that I'm talking about, say, in the hand over here. If I can make the viewer feel something in the painting, in the surface mm -hmm. of the painting, in the paint itself, mm -hmm. then the viewer now is participating. So in a certain in sense, textured skin and textured skin yeah. makes the thing palpable and, and rules it from just graphic to experiential. That's it, exactly. The, the then becomes the now. 
and then the now, you know, the viewer's place in the now, then can become a, a location in the then it's as like well. Like time, time travel in a exactly. sense. Exactly. But it's interesting because but it, it's the all surface happening of the in work as Paint is doing it, so it's in the now. Yeah. And you See, feel the tech. It's not just a graphical image of this historical person. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad you see that. Yeah. It, 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 if I can do that. Then uh, see, I, you have to have the intentionality, and I guess I do. And then uh, I have to struggle with my my inability to do it. But not but, now. When you do something like this, it's happening spontaneously, and you think about it later. You don't think I'm gonna, if I build up the texture, I'm going to grab their no, attention. No, 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 You're no. You're just doing the figure. That's so right. So this building up the texture is yeah. something that happens spontaneously within yeah. you in creating the now. That's right. But but you know what? It, it, it doesn't happen accidentally. Or, or spontaneously in the event, in, in the sense that it doesn't, it's not an objective within me. As I make the painting, I'm not thinking about it, but it's obviously subconsciously there, and it, it directs, you know, the decisions that I make. Um, so I, I guess I own it. If I made a bad painting, I, I, I'd have to own it in the same way. Uh, you know, here so you have a picture that you say uh, that you did of your mom. Yeah, you know what? It's part of, uh, of the. The, the making of this series while I was doing that uh, and, and looking for images, then I came across an image of my mother off a small identity card image. Most of these were identity card images as well. So I found an identity card image of my mother as a, a young 18-year-old girl. And uh, it struck me that, there, that somehow she must have been an influence in, in choosing uh, that series and those women to paint. And so I had to make a painting of her and uh, do you know what? I'll tell you something else that I'm finding really interesting. It, it, painting is, is kind of an introspection for me and trying to understand what goes on in my world um, is a process that's ongoing in me and painting helps me do that. In fact, probably painting is the most revelatory way that I get to understand what goes on in my world. Uh, and it, it's like going to school. Uh, you know, you take a course, you want to find out about a something or other, and so you take the course and you find out about the something you or other. You find yourself in sort of one I find myself going to school, so I found that in making this painting, and this was a one session painting, uh, then I learned a lot about who my mother was in terms of how I felt about her. You know, so as I formed the list. You see an idealization of a younger woman also. Yeah, I learned her, as a, but, but, but hang on now. See, it, it just in painting the lips, I learned about my mother is, is a sensual, sexual being. You know, in painting the, that collar of a neck, you know, that column of a neck, then I, I saw her strength. You know, at least I, I remembered how powerfully strong she was. You know, it, it, um, it, as I, you know, kind of painted the way the forms all integrate together to create a kind of an idealized, um, kind of a carving of a head, then I, I remembered how my mother had a kind of pride in the way she looked in the world, you know, in spite of, of how they tried to steal from her who she was as a woman, she hung on to that, you know, she took pride in being a, a, a certain kind of powerful, attractive woman, you know, and, and I forgot those things, or at least as, as a young boy, I wasn't aware of those kinds of things. And, and when I was, I chose not to focus on them because I was concerned about my own sexuality. And when I painted my mother this way, then I saw her as another uh, person that was in me, but sublimated. Now, this gives a chance, an opportunity to see you as a working artist. So tell us how you move from the image in the photograph to the image in the work and how you feel about that, that progress. All right, uh, well, let me tell you how I make these things. So uh, I, first of all, I select the images uh, as I find them. Uh, I, I find these images on the net. I crop them uh, and by that I mean I, 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 I compose them. So elements of composition are, that are important to me are where I put center on, on a painting and where I put eyes with respect to center. You know, some of the images, the eyes are lower, some of the images, the eyes are higher. And the feeling that I have about the location of eyes with respect to the image, it, to the center of a painting is that uh, as I raise eyes in a painting, then it, it ennobles the image in a sense. It causes the image to allow the, um, say the subject in the image to create a certain kind of dominance in its world. So it's a compositional move with social, emotional meaning embedded in it. Absolutely, 
okay? So I find center on these photographs, and then I, I, I compose them. I, I, th this is already a crop, uh, and this is a further crop of a crop. So I, I find the, uh, the composition that I use, then from the way I print off the image, then giving me the meaning that I want the subject matter to have in a compositional sense. So you've made a decision using the photographic material as your first stage. That's correct. And you do the cropping in terms of these design-related decisions that have emotional meaning about the character. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Now when I transfer the image uh, to uh, the painting, then I don't grid up the uh, the painting. I paint it freehand, or at least, uh, it, and I don't prior draw it from. But you do uh, have your diagonal lines here. Yeah, again, a because a compositional I, set. Yeah, well, again, I need to find so a center. So it's a kind so, of scaffolding. Uh, it's both a scaffolding as well as a transfer of, of why the eyes are where they are. Mm -hmm. You know, so the narrative has to sustain itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, but I don't use, uh, say, a gridding up. I, I don't score up the photograph. It's not paint by numbers, so to speak. Uh, it's paint by gesture. Yeah, meaning. But I still want accuracy, but I find that I have to give myself the ability, the opportunity to move things around. You know, so if I find that the eye is in the wrong place, then the act of trying to find the eye gives me opportunity to reveal something that I wouldn't have seen had I just put the eye in the right place. In the, and reveal, the in this case, reveal what? What do you mean reveal? Uh, Is that compositional revealing or all character of, all revealing? Of all of it, all of it. Trying to find location is a really important painting activity or drawing activity for me. The, uh, the way things uh, fall into place, you know, something here, has to relate to something over here, which has to relate to something over here, which has to relate, et cetera, et cetera. And the quality of the relationships, as well as the relationships themselves, is re very revelatory. So if I'm lucky, sometimes not finding the right place for something initially, you know, in the first place is an opportunity to try and find not just where this belongs, but where this belongs, and this belongs, and this belongs, and this belongs. You know, trying to find that that sort of hidden in code, in uh, coding that, you know, tells you where things are. So remember, I'm trying to paint to learn something about, say, the painting process as well as these it's, people. You're it's always yourself in relationship to the work. One yeah. of the things that strikes me, Harry, is that you're talking about compositional and technical decisions you have to make, but they're never separated from the meaning. Uh, the affective quality of the work. It's always, in, they're always entwined, yeah. embedded one within the other. Oh, absolutely, and it, it's not something that I think about as I paint, but it's something that I think about before and after. The painting process, see, I, I've learned to rely on, on the technology as I use it uh, to accomplish those things that I need for myself. So I don't have to do those kinds of things as I think of, or to think about those kinds of things as I paint. I know that the kind of technology that I've, d I've evolved over the time that and I've painted. And by technology means brushes and colors and scaffolding. Yeah, brush color. Your techniques. These questions. Yeah, exactly. The questions of location, uh, the colors I choose, the so this scale. Is the, well, well practiced, and you affect them when each each time you do it. But you find well, some of it's well. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's a, painting. See, the, the reason I guess I love well, one of the reasons I love painting is that it's an ongoing process. I don't think that I've even scratched the surface of the kinds of things that I can discover in painting that allows me to do those things that I want painting to mean to me. So in, 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 in showing respect to her and recreating her life, memorializing her life, it's also an opportunity for you to discover yourself as an artist. Yeah, but, and, but, but I'm not, I'm not memorializing the, the, these particular images. I, you know, I, I, I guess the, I've had to grapple with why I'm making images of, of Holocaust concentration camp guards. And, and so that's who she is? She's a Holocaust concentration camp guard. Now right? look at the difference. Because yeah. we've been talking about heroic women of the Holocaust. We've moved over to someone who's in a concentration camp guard position. But you're not, you're not approaching this in a, in, in a moralizing way. No. So what, no. Is, the, what is the similarity no, no, no. and why did you choose to do the guards as well? That's really complex. But I'll, I'll give you a, a, a real but still an easy answer for me. You know, the images that I did over here were women that were, uh, I guess, leading quite ordinary lives. But this is a, a young French girl, and um, she had a, a successful life, a young Jewish French girl. She, she was having a, a good life, I guess, uh, living, doing what she was doing as a student. Um, and she saw uh, young Jewish 
children being rounded up by the Nazis and disappearing, not returning uh, to the uh, to the town. I think it was Toulouse. I could be wrong here that she was living in, and and she discovered what was going on and what was happening to these kids, why they weren't returning. So she decided that she would do something about that, and she and, and several uh, uh, friends, colleagues, decided that they would try and rescue some of these kids before the the, the Nazis before. got them. Yeah, and uh, so she rounded up uh, groups of uh, small groups of children and smuggled them into Switzerland. And uh, on the last trip, uh, within yards, literally, uh, of um, the the border, uh, she was caught with a group of children, and she was beaten all day long so that she would reveal the names of her colleagues. She was beaten with shovels and pickaxes, apparently and she refused to divulge the names. So they tossed her into uh, the town jail overnight so that the guards, the, uh, her oppressors, would, would be able to get some sleep and some food and some drink. And in the morning, they were gonna return and, and continue the process. But during the night, her friends showed up to free her and um, she refused to go. And now, uh, She refused to go, she said, because um, if the guards returned in the morning and found her gone, they would avenge themselves on the kids that they still had. So she stayed. And um, I think that she asked her friends to try and protect the children. And I don't know what happened to the children, but the guards did return in the morning and they beat her to death with, with picks and shovels. Now the community that she was in post-war eventually discovered her story and they've turned her into a hero, I guess, posthumously, but she was just an ordinary person doing what she felt she had to do and she gave her life accordingly. And uh, I just wanted to understand that because that's really hard to understand. That's really hard to understand. I mean, how, how, how do you make the decision to stay behind and continue a beating that you know will lead to your death so that somebody else will survive. And you don't even know that that's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen in the war. And you don't know whether or not the guards will come back and beat you to death as well as the kids. Now, how do you explain this juxtaposition, this remarkable juxtaposition? She was an ordinary woman. And if I, and if I showed you this, this um, let's say, cute young lady, could you tell that she's also a Holocaust concentration camp who made a, diff a guard who made a different set of choices and that she was responsible for the death of, of hundreds, thousands of other young women that were in her care? So here's a, a woman who made a choice to give her life so that... But you so have that what? expressions. I mean, here you have another example. I really want to lean this. You want to lean this on something? Yeah. But how do you how do you tell the difference? Well, I mean, a, a look at how you handle the face. Uh, here she's smiling in the midst of horror, and you're remembering her. As see, this smiling. this is easier. This this I mean, the face here, I guess, reveals a certain kind of of skewness, a certain kind of coldness. insanity and coldness. Yeah. So we you can but less you can, so but less so in this other image. Yeah, you can read that. Okay. So now, if I were put, if I if I put this image with this image and, and my mother, and I won't, I'll not include my mother in this group, then some of these you can read more readily, okay? But basically, all of these uh, are, are women who found themselves in certain kinds of circumstances and then behaved in a revelatory fashion, okay? So that question of how does that happen now, revelatory for them or revelatory for you? Uh, on every level. I, I use the word revelatory in the, in the widest possible way I can because it reveals something here to me that I can't get at. I just can't. I can't understand it. I know there's something here to see. Some of it is easy to see, but what really Hidden matters counts, of character? Hidden social circumstances? No, how does it happen? How do I, I mean, like, I, I, I guess <laughs> if I understood enough about genetics and I could, I could understand that there's a gene out there that, that does whatever it does, so that if I could identify the gene, if I could the see its existence. Yeah, the gene of evil. Then I can say this woman had this gene of evil and this woman had this gene of goodness. Now, I can't see that. So in a you certain sense, it's like Eichmann with the ordinariness of the individual in certain circumstances where evil manifests itself or perhaps a, a disposition to be heroic 
versus a disposition to be abusive manifests itself. Yeah, or maybe it, it, it's just a, a chance event. You know, maybe it's the same person under certain circumstances could be heroic and, and in other circumstances could be evil. You know, I, I don't know what the answer is, but it's a question that intrigues me so that I need to paint to try and understand some of it. So in a certain in, sense, to summarize what we've been talking about here, the, the act of painting for you is something that's very, very important, very fundamental. The act of painting for you is something that shows your, your ongoing relationship to the work, because the work creates you as you create the work. For example, in the instance of your uncovering or rediscovering or appreciating the, some, some of the beautiful subtleties of your mother and how it changed your relationship. That's right. Here, these are ongoing dilemmas of understanding. Here, this heroic thing we marvel at protecting the children and these aspects of evil are more challenging to find out how people who are ordinary can end up in such evil circumstances. But you're always implicated in the process of discovery. Well, is, yeah. Is it, it not it, a burden? Yeah, I, you're all right there. but but. There's still a bottom to this well, and I don't know where it is. So I don't know what it is that I'm looking for, you know. So we, we describe some of the things that are obviously going on in me as I paint, as you know, as I as I go down this this well, you know, as I am as I empty each each bucket that I bring up. So there's something at the bottom of this well that is 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 a, an opportunity and to understand the condition of, of life on this, you know. It, but at the same time, you don't turn off. You're dealing with such incredibly emotionally powerful events and aspects of grotesque, and yet you're able to go back to the palette again. So yeah. it does not turn you off. It's a no, kind of no, 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 no. Oh, I see what you mean by turn off. No, no, no. I mean, uh, I, I, in the sense of it's too heavy. Turn away. It's difficult. There are times that I find it very difficult to come into the studio and I drag my ass and, and then I wind up, uh, I'll, I'll maybe paint a still life that day or, 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 or work on a commission. See, I mean, th this is work that I'm obviously doing for myself. It doesn't have, uh, say, commercial value. I, you know, it, uh, I'm not sure that it'll be, it'll see the light of day. I, you know, I show it periodically. See the light of day here. Yeah, light exactly. Yeah, but it, it it's it doesn't have the kind of commercial value that a lot it's of a kind of existential voyage in time. Yeah. With you as an artist, yeah. doing that exploration in the search of human meaning. Yeah, I, I find that it, it's I find this really interesting that when I read. I don't have the, the same opportunity to reflect on these questions in the same way as when I paint. And, and when I paint, it's not a reflection that I do as I read. It's not the kind as of... As paint either. Yeah, it, that's right, after. as I paint, but there's a kind of a subconscious... Uh, um, Exploration? Yeah, I, I don't even know what it is, but there's a kind of palpitation that's going on subconsciously because I, I'm not only looking for ideas, I'm looking to bring them into reality. See, like the, the point you made about that painting over there, you know, I need to have an essential event take place in my painting. So the reason that that takes place, the, the reason that that occurs is because I must have a, a, a need to have a sensual event take place so within now, me in that consideration of that. So in, in, in the midst of dealing with such powerful themes, there is the sensuality of painting as such as a process that's quite separate from the heaviness of the narrative. Yeah, and, that can bring you back and, and let me and let me make sure we both understand how we're using the word sensuality. So it, it, it's it's sensuality in the in, in the sense in the gesture. It's the it's a, it, it's it's the belief that I have that this world exists for me in in um, in terms of the 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 perceptual events that I can experience. You know, so it has to have that kind of experiential I mean, quality to it. Yeah, meaning for me is akin to perception. So if I can, you know, in the midst, bring us to a conclusion. On the one hand, you have meaning that has perception. And on the other hand, you have meaning that reaches back to a different era that for people in our community uh, is fundamentally uh, embittered. But you're able to yeah, build but, a bridge but, between those two. But to build that bridge, I have to have a perceptual apparatus. I, you know, my painting does that for me. My painting allows that bridge to occur, and I do it uh, by bringing the painting into a real place. So it's not just a picture, but it's an, it, it's it's the concretization of of feeling, of thought. You know, of of, of uh, those kinds of of. Uh, let me say, uh, uh, how do I uh, how do I categorize thought? See, I need to have thought result in a central event. Great. Thank you so much, Harry. That's beautiful. You're welcome.